Good afternoon. I now call to order the June 17th meeting of the Curriculum and Instruction Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum and instruction committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Fink today if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Fink, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. The committee, Ms. Pasteur. Present. Mr. Offerman. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. Mr. Mahomza. Are there any other board members present? Ross Kuhn is here. Ms. Fink. I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Uh, Kuhn has called in. Um, Thank you. Ms. President. Uh, Ms. Fink, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. Dr. Pirandozzi? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fink. I am, uh, just before I turn it over to Ms. McComas, so we can, Dr. McComas, so we can get started, um, want to just say to everyone, I can say it at the end, but I want to say it now as we go into the beginning. At the end, we will talk about dates and time, but I do want to thank everyone, staff members particularly, and committee members for your work this school year. I think we've gotten a lot done and I appreciate the diligence. And Mr. Corns, thank you so much for keeping us virtually on top of our game. Having said that, I now turn it over to Dr. McComas to get us started. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Pasteur and other members of the board. Welcome, uh, Mr. Kuhn. It's nice for you to join us today. So our first agenda item is um, just an update. I'm sorry. Our first agenda item is our curriculum committee dates for next year. This is an approval item. Um, if we could have a vote, you, it pretty much follows the same pattern uh, that we've um, followed in terms of, I think it's like the third week of the month. Before we do that, I want to add to that Dr. McComas so we can just take one vote. Um, uh, committee members, I am 
I am recommending uh, for your consideration that we begin our meeting at two o'clock instead of 2.30. We always seem rushed uh, because three of us are on the equity committee, which follows this one immediately. And this will give us plenty of time to do our work and hopefully even have a moment to exhale as we go from this meeting to the next. So I would appreciate um, Ms. that. Hester, but yes. There might be a third part that we might be able to discuss and add okay. to a motion. All right, go ahead. Are we in a position today to make a decision if we as a committee want to continue to meet virtually as opposed to at Greenwood? Um, this, that part we can certainly discuss, but this is the information that will go on board. Oh, great. Okay. okay, that's the difference. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, so either way, we're going to have to do the time and the dates, and then we will discuss. I mean, we had discussed that we wanted to continue uh, virtually, and I think other committees are doing that. But for the sake of this, just so Tracy can get it onto board docs and out there, I just like those pieces. But thank you for bringing that up because we do want to get back to that, even though we discussed that at another meeting. All I'll right. So, motion. Well, thank you, Ms. Mack. I move that we adopt the 2021-2022 meeting scheduled as um, will be shown in board docs with a starting time for all curriculum committee meetings of two o'clock. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Can I get a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Fink, will you do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Hester? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is Mr. Mahamza here? at this point? No? Okay. Thank you. All right, then we have a majority vote on that. And so thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, we'll see that Ms. Gover gets this with the time change. And thank you, committee members. All right, continue, Dr. McComas. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And um, thank you, everyone, for um, settling our, our meeting time for uh, next year. And I'll work with Ms. Gover. Um, additionally, our next agenda item is to provide you an update on our curriculum audit with MSDE. As many of you know, um, we did um, we did engage with MSDE. They're working through school systems to do audits of curriculum. We, of course, um, we were not in the very first round of schools that they were working with because they focused on school systems that had schools that were in comprehensive school improvement. Um, and we were not a school district in that tier of schools. Our um, opportunity as a result, we initiate our own math audit a year out. Um, and all of you are aware of where we are with implementing the recommendations. And I just personally want to say thank you for your support in um, our next stage of the math resources that we're happy to begin implementing next year as part of that uh, response. Last year, um, MSDE um, was able to connect with us. They were finally able to, to serve us in terms of a curriculum audit. Uh, we had just preliminary meetings with MSDE's team last February, excuse me, last March. It was quite frank, honestly, the week that schools were, the emergency situation went into place and schools were, facilities were closed. And so at that point, um, Nothing really occurred this past September. We met again with the team from MSDE. Um, at that point, um, we had begun the process of having them audit our English language arts commit um, curriculum. However, uh, some of that uh, process came to a halt, of course, with our um, ransomware event. And um, we just met with them again uh, about three weeks ago, would you say, Ms. Shea? Time is running on for me. And long story short, 
where we are is they had been focused on other schools in this tier uh, throughout this year. They will begin again in earnest uh, next September to revisit our English Language Arts Committee. Uh, they have assured us that they have um, worked to hire the curriculum reviewers because they do extensive training and calibration uh, with their reviewers to ensure that our curriculums are fully aligned to the Maryland College and Career Standards. Ms. Shea, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, just that we did briefly also talk about where we are with math and because mm -hmm. of the wonderful support that we got from all of you at the last board meeting and um, because we met with them prior to the board meeting, we had shared our vision and the plan we were bringing forward, but we can now circle back to them to let them know about the board's support of adopting a high quality instructional material all the way through um, our high level math classes. So we had let them know that that was on our horizon. They were very excited about our choice of illustrative math and so um, we will I did uh, send an email to circle back and let them know that that was approved um, as part of that as well. OK, so that really concludes the update. The update is that because of multiple reasons it was deferred until next school year around ELA. Uh, but we will continue to keep you updated. I was disappointed that we weren't able to make more progress on that this year, but given the world events and our own local events, um, it's to be understood. So we'll keep you updated on that. So thank, 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 thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. McComas and uh, Ms. Shea. Uh, Ms. Mack has a question, but before Ms. Mack asks her question, I'm going to ask you, Dr. Um, um, McComas, to do the honors of introducing Mr. Elmendorf, please. Yes, so thank you. Is Dr. Elmendorf with us here? He joined, yes. Yes, great. Tracy's fantastic. Um, so uh, Dr. Elmendorf, if you could um, put on your camera, we are um, pleased to share that Dr. Elmendorf is our newest executive director of educational options. That's our department within curriculum and instruction uh, that oversees many, many educational programs, magnet programs, our home and hospital, our extended year learning program, our um, extended day learning program, oversees our summer programming orchestration, uh, and of course oversees our digital safety uh, team and library media services. I think I've covered everything. So there's quite an extensive program. And of course, our virtual learning program will fall under uh, his leadership as well. Um, and so Dr. Elmendorf, Hi, welcome. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yes. I'm sorry I had to join through my phone. I was out at bus duty when the when the uh, group call came in, <laughs> so I apologize. But uh, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to being in this position. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're very happy. We're well, it's I guess it's a two sided coin. Uh, Dr. Hager is lamenting your departure. Uh, but we're happy to have you in um, curriculum and instruction, and I know we'll all be just as happy uh, to have you here as we were to have you uh, in your, your school. And so welcome, uh, just because if you don't mind, Ms. Mack, let Dr. Hager, I want to hear her whine just one time. Oh. <laughs> I, I already well, texted him and told him. I know, but this is all here, Dr. Hager. Let's let us see no, that. Uh, Dr. E was with my my kids at Hillcrest, and then I oh, with them at Catonsville Middle. So I've known him for so long, and so I'm very excited for his new role at the school system. It's going to be great. And great. I think she certainly gives you a glowing endorsement. So we do look forward to you joining this wonderful group. Wonderful. <laughs> So, thank you well, very much. And thank you for joining us, taking the time out of what I know is still your busy schedule to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes, I have a question about two items. Um, and I don't, I, I have to be honest and say I had forgotten about the curriculum audit, That's but okay. it kind of makes sense to me, which is why I'm bringing it up. Sure. Um, Three meetings ago and then two meetings ago, we talked about interventions for both dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and um, dyslexia. And then the two months ago, we talked about um, the Ready to Read Act. And in both of those meetings, we looked at the 
intervention pyramid and I should have looked at it again before this meeting, but I do believe that foundations was for a tier three to be implemented by either a special educator or a reading specialist. So my first question, am I correct there? You are correct that that is how we currently use it in BCPS. OK, thank you. Um, so I was told that there was a meeting. Um, some teachers and reading specialists reached out to me to say that there was a meeting that we are no longer going to be using foundations. I've had other teachers tell me that they have not used it for a while. So if I could get a clarification on whether or not we are using it, I was told that not only are we not using it, but there's some type of manipulative or something that teachers find helpful that they had to send back. And I'm just a little concerned because we saw that as a tier three intervention. So Ms. Mack, thank you for that question. I have to admit I'm not prepared to give you detailed answers on that, but I will absolutely take that back and talk with Ms. Kraft and Dr. Wolf and ELA um, because it sounds like there was some follow-up communication about materials. As you know, we recently took forward um, a contract. My guess is that potentially this is about the version of foundations that we currently have and I only say that just because I know that we had to you remember we brought forward that contract and Wilson which is the organization that um, publishes foundations was one of the vendors so I wonder and I I, I don't want to speak out of turn which is why I need to take it back um, but I think it could be not that we are banning it or that it's no longer a helpful program but I'm wondering if it's about the version that we currently own and what that will look like in transition um, or what would replace it so so, um, I and that was actually going to be my next question. 100%. If it's going away, what would replace it? Replacing it, absolutely. So um, I will take that back, and then what I'll do is follow up with Dr. McComas to get you that answer in detail. And then okay. I, I think you're going to have to come back to me on this one too. Okay. Um, when I first came on the board, I asked specific questions about the passport program, and I could go through my notes and find the accolades that were given. But I understand that that contract is expiring in no, in September, and we are not approving it. Do, are we going to provide any type of, is a summary going to be provided to the board on the outcomes of using that product? Um, what, you know, what did we gain or anything like that and why we stopped using it? So Ms. Beck, I'll need you to help me a little bit because Passport is the name of the Baltimore County designed program. It's not itself a contract. There were um, resources that had contracts associated. At one point we used, you'll remember Middlebury. Um, that is a contract that we did not review because of an integration into Schoology. It was not effective and we actually created curriculum called virtual learning modules. Um, so I would just need a little clarification about what specific contract that you're referencing. I'll have the contract because, number. I'll send, I'll send it to you an email. Perfect. I'll send it. That, okay, that's perfect. Then I'll be able to get you specific answers. Okay, thank you. Sure. As uh, always. Thank you, Ms. Um, Shea. Sure. All right, Dr. McComas, back to you. Okay, with no further ado, um, I will turn it over to Ms. Um, Ms. Shea and our health team um, to share with you um, updates based on Comar revisions around our health education program. So. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. McComas, and I want to echo um, Dr. Hager's excitement. We are really excited to be here today to have this time. We know the Curriculum Committee uh, agenda, as Ms. Pesture mentioned, is tight, and it's precious commodity to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and really advocate for the programs and curricular revisions we're making on behalf of children. Um, this one in particular is near and dear to my team's heart. Um, I have with me today our Director of the Office of Health and PE, Chris Schumacher, our Coordinator of Health and PE, Michelle Prozer, and and our Supervisor of Health ed Education, um, Kirsten Roller. This is a um, phenomenal team who works really, really hard to support the needs of our students and prioritize our health education. We had occasion based on a number of factors that we're going to describe today um, to explain why it became necessary to make revisions to our grade five health education program. Um, so in this presentation today, we're going to describe our why, um, beginning with legislation and revision, revisions to the MSDE framework, um, and then also talk about our what and our how so that you have a clear clear understanding of where we've been um, and where we are going. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, I think, Ms. Roller to, to pick up from here, but any member of my health team will certainly um, pick up and take it to the next slide, Mr. Corns, and I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you so Thank much, Kirsten. Um, yeah, as Megan uh, had just shared, or Ms. Shea just shared, our why really is rooted in legislation, COMAR, and really 
the changes that were made at the state level. Um, Michelle, did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Nope, you're good to go. I, I don't know. I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, I don't know what happens. Um, so basically our, our grade five revisions really began from changes made at the state level, starting with our revised health education Comar that came out in December of 2019. As part of the revisions in Comar, there was a revised opt out procedure related to family life and human sexuality indicators. Um, and what this means is in an opt out procedure that families still have to be notified about the upcoming lessons related to puberty health education and family life. But teachers will only be collecting back forms back from those students whose families decide that they don't want them to participate um, in the objectives related to family life and puberty health education. Um, so essentially, if a teacher does not receive a form back, then consent is implied that that child can participate in the lessons. Um, with that being said, each school must still make arrangements to permit students who opt out to receive instruction related to um, health education and just in an alternative learning environment. This school year, because of the pandemic, even though this was released in December 2019, we left it as a school based decision about whether to use an opt in or opt out procedure. Um, and this was really rooted in the nature of the pandemic, and we know that some schools really had a, a, a tough time reaching families, while other schools had abundance of communication with families. So again, we left that up to the school for this school year. Next school year, it is the expectation that we'll be aligned with the health education Comar, and we'll be using and moving to an opt-out procedure. And again, to reiterate, in an opt-out procedure, families are still notified that the lessons are upcoming and parents do have the ability to still opt their children out. Um, we also with those that are opting out for the alternative learning assignments to standardize that procedure, we did create an enrichment packet that students can do for a project based learning um, assignment and this is built out in a packet format and we also built this out virtually on Schoology. Um, another revision that we found in the revised Comar is that any student who opts out of puberty education must still receive instruction related to menstruation. Previously in Comar, it, it said only those girls opting out. Now it is for all students opting out. Um, we, as you'll see, we did make a packet that can go home with families after the teacher talks to the parents or caregivers about how best to receive that instruction. We're also leaning in on our school nurses to provide that education if necessary. Um, also, what we'll, I'll bring this up later too, but in the revised Comar, they updated it to say that instruction shall represent all students regardless of ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. So you can see the equity piece and inclusive language used there. Our why also was rooted in some national changes with the national sexuality education standards being released in 2020. And then the Maryland Health Education Framework was released in May. Um, in that framework, there were substantial revisions and related to family life and human sexuality, there are now gender identity and expression indicators that begin in kindergarten and puberty indicators can begin in grade four. I do want to note that in the revised Comar, it still says that students st shall receive instruction related to family life and human sexuality in grade five or earlier. So we in Baltimore County are sticking with grade five. Our teachers have um, that have already been teaching grade five have been trained in these indicators um, and these revisions again are moving forward in grade five. And then also our why is the, because of the substantial revisions related to family life and human sexuality indicators. Next slide please. Our why also is rooted in state legislation um, and our, so the state legislation of Aaron's law came out in 2016 and then a very similar law was passed in 2018 related to family life and human sexuality based in boundaries and consent. Um, essentially, these educational laws mandate that students shall participate in age appropriate instruction on the awareness and prevention of sexual abuse and assault um, prevention education. Um, students must also be provided the meaning and instruction related to consent and respecting personal boundaries as part of the family life and human sexuality curriculum. 
our lessons related to family life are related to sexual abuse and assault prevention education will be found in our um, we have a light lesson on consent in our changes in me unit but the full indicators related to sexual abuse and assault prevention education are part of our safety and injury prevention unit as these indicators have nothing to do with family life and human sexuality they are rooted in safety of our children okay next slide please <clears throat> okay now that you have a big picture of the reasons behind our revisions i'll be breaking down our um breaking down our what into the various subtopics related to puberty education and the human sexuality umbrella okay so to begin our revised curriculum will move the puberty health education unit to unit four. Currently, it is taught in unit four of um, health education, and sometimes this is week eight, nine, or even 10 of fourth quarter. And what we have heard from our teachers and in, in our process in you know, creating these revisions is that many of their students have already begun puberty um, well in advance of the May, June of their grade five year. We're also moving it to grade two because per the state framework, they have the indicators in grade four and five. We would like to get it as close to grade four as possible. Okay, I just want to make it clear. It's, it's unit two still in grade five. Yes. Unit two, grade five. Okay. Um, another thing I want to note that was removed from the MSD framework is that they removed HIV prevention education in grade five, and it's now addressed in grade six in this disease and control and prevention unit. Um, so that's just another thing to note. Okay, next slide. Okay, so on the slide that you'll see are indicators in the revised framework from MSDE related to sexual anatomy, physiology, and education. Um, so there's three indicators that are in this sector of family life. Um, the first one describes the human reproductive systems, including medically accurate names for internal and external genitalia and their functions. Describe how puberty prepare, prepares human bodies for the potential to reproduce and identify that reproduction requires that a sperm and egg join and implant. Next slide, please. So with those indicators up here, our current practice is that students describe physical changes that occur in males and females during puberty. In our revision, you'll notice that we have removed the gender pronouns and we are focusing on physiology. So students will describe the physical changes that occur in human bodies during puberty. Previously, human reproduction was not defined and now teachers will define conception and that the sperm, <clears throat> it just what the indicator says, requires that a sperm and egg cell join and implant in the uterus. Currently, when students ask about reproduction, the teacher says, that's a great question um, for your parents. And now as part of our Changes in Me unit, students will actually have an opportunity to learn how to access valid and reliable health resources to help them answer their questions related to sexual health. So if a question comes up about, and this is what we hear from teachers all the time, is that students say, well, how does the sperm get in there? We can now also direct them to not only their trusted adult, but also the, those valid and reliable resources that may be web-based. Okay, next slide. Kirsten, if I could chime in too. Sure. Um, Kirsten, Kirsten already mentioned the directions around the parent preview. Um, these resources that Kirsten mentioned that students will be taught about how to access valid and reliable health resources will also be a part of that preview that are shared with parents. We hear sometimes from parents and caregivers who themselves are looking for support of medically accurate and developmentally appropriate ways to have these um, conversations with their um, children and to do so in a way that is um, appropriate but also medically um, accurate. So I just wanted to note that those resources will also be shared as part of that parent preview. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. OK, next slide, please. OK, the next indicators are related to gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. Um, before I get to these, I did want to attach and um, align our indicators from MSD with our BCPS um, equity policy, Title IX, as well as COMAR. So in our equity policy, it states that disparities based on the basis of race, special education status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, including gender expression, are unacceptable and at directly at odds with the belief that all students can achieve. I found this policy really fitting to fit in with our support and rationale for the revised MSDE standards related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, 
it's really important that our puberty education and family life unit addresses as well as acknowledges gender identity and sexual orientation in order to be inclusive of students and aligned with our policy. I also added our policy 0200 as I feel that um, the MSC revisions related to sexual orientation and gender identity are related to our commitment as a school system to provide every student with the highest quality 21st education um, that is in a safe, secure and positive environment conducive to high levels of teaching and learning and student engagement. We know that our LGBTQ students needs are often neglected in puberty health education lessons and as their experiences are often ignored and not addressed in the curriculum. As um, I go forward, you'll see how we are really trying to create this gender inclusive health education program, not just in puberty health ed, but in all of our resources. Um, it benefits students because it recognizes and affirms them. Research upon research states that students who see themselves reflected in health and really all curriculum are more likely to succeed in school academically. Um, I also put in our COMAR, our health education COMAR again, going back to you know, that second slide is that family life and human sexuality instruction shall re represent all students regardless of ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Next slide, please. Okay, so the indicators that we will be addressing, if you notice, um, you'll see that they are in third, fourth, and fifth grade. We are keeping this in grade five um, for next school year. So the first indicator is to demonstrate ways to promote dignity and respect for all genders, gender expressions, and gender identities. Identify sexual orientation as a, as a person's physical and or romantic attraction to an individual of the same or different gender. And then the grade five indicators to explain why it is wrong to tease, or bully others based on personal characteristics such as body type, gender, sexuality, appearance, mannerisms, and the way one dresses or acts. Currently, um, we do not address any of these indicators in our curriculum. In our revised unit, the um, in the revised lesson, it's called Respect for All, and it's really rooted in empathy building for our students and trying to consider how people may express themselves differently. In the lesson, students examine the term gender as a relationship between our body, identity, and expression. The teacher will define terms related to prejudice, discrimination, sexual orientation, sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, and gender roles. Um, after the teacher defines those terms with students, the students then analyze the societal gender roles and how such roles may be hurtful. And then finally, it ends in a little advocacy project where students will explain why everyone deserves respect, regardless of their gender, how they express themselves and who they are attracted to. Next slide. We know that um, gender is very complex, so this is actually um, an image that our students will see in one of our PowerPoint presentations related to gender. And it's trying to help students understand this complex interrelationship between a person's body, identity and gender. Um, so in this you know, part, the teacher will explain that our body, our experience in our body and how society genders our bodies and how others uh, react to our bodies is you know, that term body. The identity is then that internal thought in your mind about how you name or gender your body as a boy or girl, a combination of both or neither, really how you identify in your mind of who you consider yourself to be. And then expression is that outward expression in how you present your gender to the world and how society, culture, community, families, et cetera, interact with that um, as they see you expressing your gender. So we just kind of give a foundation to students so that they can be able to demonstrate respect for all people, regardless of how they express themselves or identify. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> the next indicators are related to our consent education. Again, this is connected to the educational laws that were passed with House Bill 251 and House Bill 72. Um, in our consent education lessons, students analyze the relationship between consent and personal boundaries. They explain the importance of sharing all information with parents, guardians, trusted adults. They'll define sexual mistreatment, grooming, harassment, abuse, assault, and exploitation. And then they identify strategies to respond to sexual violence. And then they also explained that if anyone was ever uh, mistreated, sexually groomed, harassed, abused, assaulted, and exploited, it's not the fault of the victim. So there is that empathy piece in there. Um, I do want to reiterate that consent education as well as sexual abuse assault prevention education is safety. 
These indicators are not addressed in the changes in me unit and there is no opt out procedure needed for consent or sexual abuse prevention. OK, next slide. <clears throat> OK, so currently in health education, these indicators are not addressed. Um, some of these indicators are addressed in the 30 minute school counseling lesson that students uh, get every December. When we worked with school counselors in creating our lessons, and what we landed on is that this uh, consent education and uh, sexual abuse and assault prevention education will be in unit three, quarter three, so that students will have that little bit of foundation from school counselors in December and then our lessons during quarter two. Um, I do wanna note that the school counseling lessons are all body safety, so it's not just sexual and abuse uh, prevention, it also includes neglect, um, physical abuse, et cetera. They also in school counseling do not define grooming. Um, just to kind of level set what what you know what we're what we're, the revisions are related to. So in our revised lessons, students will analyze the relationship between consent and personal boundaries. They will view a video called Consent for Kids, which does a really nice job just breaking it down in kid-friendly language. Um, students learn the different types of abuse, including sexual abuse and grooming. And then students will identify those safe trusted adults that they can um, reach out to and they actually practice in our lesson how to respond to sexual abuse scenarios. And then the teacher does a read aloud of room 204 and that um, read aloud not only talks about sexual abuse, but it will also help students understand that it is not the victim's fault for people who are abused. OK, next slide. Um, so again, our revisions were really rooted in trying to create this inclusive puberty health education curriculum that is aligned with our own policy related to equity as well as COMAR. Um, and there's really five you know, pillars that we've used as a foundation, and these pillars come from research from the leading organizations related to inclusive puberty health education. And the first one is to provide that foundation of gender literacy. And in that, we need to, uh, to stop the practice of separating students based upon assumed gender. Um, gender literacy also provides students with that foundation to understand puberty and human growth and development in a manner that creates understanding and comfort with the individual pathways, as well as we know that there's a variety of pathways that they may be experienced by their peers. Um, in our revised lessons, uh, you know, rooted in our development was to try to distinguish patterns from rules. For example, um, we know that students, even at very young children, you know, can see that many gender stereotypes are not true for themselves or classmates. So we try to disrupt that for our students and start to think about how gender might be influenced from society. Um, we know that if educators only share examples of gender and physiology that are consistent with assumed patterns, it's easy for students to conclude that those patterns are rules. Um, however, when differences are discussed without judgment, students are given the opportunity to recognize themselves and everyone around them as natural parts of that human diversity. As part of our revisions, we um, are also seeking to emphasize physiology rather than gender. Um, so you'll see in our revisions, we'll say a person with a penis, a person with a vulva, rather than attaching a um, assumed gender with a body part. So we focus on the function, um, as opposed to connecting those parts to a particular gender. We also, in our revised lessons, really try to show that there's tremendous diversity in human bodies and the way they grow and develop into adulthood. Um, educators who convey that range of experiences in people really help students to see that their path is within a norm rather than saying all boys will develop facial hair. Um, so we really tried to normalize the many different paths that you know children will go through as they form their adult bodies. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so that is the what, those are the proposed um, revisions. And then our how really started in the summer of 2019 when we met with our stakeholders as part of the Family Life and Human Sexuality Committee. Um, again, that was in the spring of 2019. We have had and continue to have ongoing conversations with health services and school counseling. Um, this was before, during, and after. I actually have school counselors right now reviewing one final time um, some of our edits to make sure that we're consistent in language with what is shared in health services and school counseling. Um, we also collaborated with MSDE. We have a state health education PLN that we meet monthly, um, and family life is always on our agenda. 
and then we've also collaborated with some national organizations. One of these organizations is called Advocates for Youth. Um, this is a leading organization. They have a curriculum called the three R's and it's a free and open resource and um, MSDE recently worked with them and they took their lessons that were you know, for public and they actually aligned the MSE framework and indicators with their lessons. So now if you were to go on their site, you can actually click Maryland and you can see their lesson and then the indicators from our state that are addressed in their lesson. So that, that's really exciting that we have that. Um, we also conducted focus groups this spring with principals, grade five teachers and parents. Um, overwhelmingly, the feedback from our collaborative meetings and focus group was extremely positive. Um, However, we did hear consistently from every person was that our revisions need to be communicated to stakeholders as well as the need to develop support resources for our educators. And that will get me to um, our next slide, if you would please. Um, so looking at the resources, we're trying to be as um, inclusive and broad as possible to support our teachers and really trying to come up with like a multimodal approach to reach teachers where they are and what they you know and any support that they may need. So we really started with developing print and web based resources for our teachers to support their instruction. Um, we have a guiding document about handling challenging questions from students. We worked with advocates for youth. There's actually a five minute training video that walks through a framework for teachers and how to handle those questions, um, the meaning behind a question, um, developing guidance about how a teacher can respond to questions that may be out of the scope of our BCPS um, indicators and objectives. We also create documents on how to establish ground rules, how to use a question box, um, a physical question box, and we adapted that this year, and how to create a virtual question box. Um, which a lot of teachers said they actually enjoy um, better. We gave detailed instructions for each lesson. Um, every PowerPoint has exactly what the teacher can say embedded in the instructional notes as well as in that lesson plan. Um, I created a puberty health education instructional checklist that says, you know, did you um, send home the opt out letter? Did you provide families a time to preview materials? Um, you know, preparing, setting ground rules, et cetera. I mentioned that enrichment packet that we created for students opting out. And again, that's virtual as well as paper. We created a summary of gender inclusive puberty education. And then we also created talking points for teachers um, about you know, why we are teaching puberty health ed for families who may be asking, well, why does my child need to know this? We're equipping and empowering our teachers to answer those questions um, in a research-based answer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, we also developed some teacher and parent caregiver resources, including a sample opt out letter that our, our schools can push out. We developed again potential parent caregiver questions and answers that teachers can respond. Um, as Megan shared, we created a document about what every parent needs to know about puberty health education. And in that there are different web based resources that parents can go to. Um, you know, so if your child comes home and asks you this question, you know, what is sexual intercourse? The parent can actually go to a site that's valid and reliable to help answer um, answer their, their child's question. We developed the preparing for menstruation packet for those students opting out. And then we're also standardizing the uh, parent preview materials of instructional resources. So that'll now be something that we can put on Schoology and then we can make sure that all, all parents are receiving the same information regarding our instructional materials. OK, next slide. Um, so again, we heard from everyone that communication is essential. So, you know, pending um, approval, we would like to create webinars for principals, teachers and nurses. Um, th in this July and August, we would like to share like the what, the why, the how with principals that they're prepared to work with their teachers when they come back in August. Um, from the questions from principals, teachers, we would like to create an FAQ doc that we can share out with principals and teachers. Um, we're going to create that screencast overview of materials for the parents and then for each lesson, um, I have created a voiceover PowerPoint training that will model how to use inclusive language or how to implement this, what questions to ask your students, um, what this looks like in practice. And then to ensure fidelity of implementation, we have created a Google form checklist for principals so that can be pushed out to principals to say, um, have you provided time for families to preview materials? Are you, um, you know, sent home the opt out letter to your families? Have you, um, you know, made it sure that all students are being taught 
together in a heterogeneous classroom. You're not separating based on gender. Um, have you worked with your team to prepare for questions, etc.? So we can really make sure that our, our resources are being implemented. All right, next slide, please. Um, and this is our last slide in some teacher training that we're preparing for. So we will have an overview of curriculum resources, the what, the why, the how, the lesson revisions at PSD this uh, fall. We will also are requesting that principals provide two Mondays before quarter two that their teachers can um, participate in some asynchronous training to prepare them to teach the revisions. Um, we also would like to offer half day training if it's approved to pull teachers, grade five teachers to walk through the revisions, especially related to gender and using inclusive language, and then full day training for any teacher new to teaching grade five. Um, we would also like to create some FYI sessions for principals, APs, teachers, nurses, and school counselors in the fall, and then also offer some additional professional development related to inclusive puberty health ed, as well as effective practices in puberty health ed and sexual abuse prevention. Um, I did also find out recently that the state, um, it's hopefully going to be finalized by the summer, but the state has actually created a online module that's a one hour module about teaching sexual abuse prevention at the elementary level. So really excited for that. I saw their substance abuse one, it's on point, um, and I'm assuming and hopeful that their sexual abuse prevention education is just as good. Um, so that'll be a great resource that we can use in our county as well. We have always offered a one credit CPD course um, related to teaching family life and human sexuality. That is actually a requirement in COMAR. Um, it has been a requirement in COMAR that teachers must have specialized training before teaching family life and human sexuality. And in our county, we use this one credit hybrid our uh, CPD course. And then pending approval of our resources, the teachers, the instructors of that course will be trained in implementing um, the course that's aligned with our revisions. Um, so that's our what, why, how. I know that was a lot. Um, so I would you know, like to take this time if anybody has any questions or if you need me to review anything, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, Kirsten, great job. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you very much, thank you. I see that, um, all right, I'm looking at how this popped out. I actually saw Dr. Hager's before I saw Ms. Mack pop up. So I'll go to Dr. Hager and then Ms. Mack, if you will. Um, I'll be quick. I just want to thank uh, Kirsten so much. I, I feel so lucky that we have you guys here in Baltimore County doing this great work around health education. I've known Kirsten and Michelle for a really long time, and this is just really wonderful. Most of the questions I had you answered for me because you did such okay. a good job with the presentation. Um, I am really happy we're going to move forward with the opt out uh, procedure and offering it earlier um, as early as possible in fifth grade, I think would be the best. Um, and I just wanted to um, to mention to everyone, and I'm sure many of you know this, but health education is so heavily legislated. And so the work that needs to be done to constantly keep up with um, mandates around things that we need to teach within health education can be really challenging. And I, I really love the way that you aligned all of these changes with uh, both the Board of Ed policies and the state policies. And um, and so my only real question though is, uh, is there a way for us to access those valid and reliable web sources that you mentioned? That we're gonna share with the teacher, with the parents? Yeah, um, are they available now for, um, for others to see or? I can share them with you certainly. Okay, thank you. That's it. No thank you, Dr. Hager. And um, thank you, uh, Ms. Roller, for that presentation. Outstanding, very clear, very thorough. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, thank you very much, Ms. Roller. And actually, Dr. Hager, I wrote down valid and reliable health sources. So I, I, I think I too, I think all of us should see that. Um, I am concerned about, um, you know, children who might have led a sheltered life accessing resources, seeing body parts that their family has had no discussion with them about and having it in out of context. So um, I, I would like to see what kids would have access to. And then- so um, address that real quick. So in the, yeah, in the lesson, um, the students learn valid and reliable resources not through the context of sexual health. Um, they learn about how to recognize like .org, .edu. So it's in a broad term, if that makes sense. 
the valid and reliable sources that we'll share with parents, we will give a disclaimer that because you can't, there really is no site that a person can go to that just shows puberty health education. They could land on many different things, which I think is the concern that you're bringing up. Yes. So the lesson is more broad in um, accessing the valid and reliable resources as a whole. So the right. students learn about like accuracy. Is it current? Is it easy to use? Um, and again, looking at who says it, are there ads on the page? It's a more broad lesson. Okay, and th thank you for that. That allays yeah. my concerns um, very much. My other concern is, you know, we know that we have students whose parents are very, very busy who may not be looking in their folder that they bring home. So they may not see the opt out form. And then mm -hmm. the next thing you know, they're coming home talking about things that the parents might find alarming. Are are we as a school system going to make an announcement? Are principals going to include the fact that this is coming in their letters that they send out to parents? Are we going to give parents who want to every opportunity to opt out if they do not want their kids to have this training? There will be so, multiple ways. Yeah, there will be multiple sorry, ways that I, we can. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, can I speak to that first and then I'll turn it over to you? Sure. Sure. So Ms. Mack, thank you for the question. So the first answer, as Ms. Roller started to say, is yes and yes and yes. It's part of the reason why, as Ms. Roller shared, even though that legislation about changing was in December of 19, we did not make that switch during the pandemic because we did not want to have parents be unaware. And we knew that many communities were having a challenge with all the different communication that was coming out in response. So we absolutely support that notion of multiple means of communicating. I do want to just add, and we actually have talked about partnering even with with family and community engagement and the wonderful work Suhan does about um, workshops or resources we can support through multiple avenues. I also want to be sure that we're not framing it as if we're doing something wrong and that no, parents I, I understand, but some parents have, for whatever reason, have different beliefs. Than are other nervous, parents. of course, and we want parents to be informed and we want them to be partners in that um, work and in the teaching so that they're prepared to answer those questions um, for their students. So as Ms. Roller said, we're going to definitely take multiple avenues to make sure all the families are aware and also aware of the why so that they understand everything we shared with you, although in a more digestible um, way. And hopefully some will even access this presentation that we're sharing, which is another reason we were grateful to have the time and space to talk about it. Ms. Roller, do you want to add anything to what I shared? Oh, uh, Megan, I would like to just say that um, also schools are responsible for informing the parents and letting them see the preview prior to the lessons occurring. Thank you. And then I know you're all going to be shocked. I'm going to end with thank you very much for listening to me and anticipating my question about when will teachers be <laughs> trained on this, when, what time will be given, because there's the slide right in front of me. So I truly appreciate it and just want to make sure that this this absolutely is for teachers is not optional and we we will ensure that every teacher who delivers this training has been trained. Yes, and so one thing I want to add and, and uh, my team will share with you, it was because of the inspiration of both you and Ms. Pastor. Um, one of the things that we're going to add is this idea of when we train our principals, um, collecting information from principals of dates of when they're holding the parent information nights, when their teachers have been trained, because you will often ask of me, how do you know, Ms. Shea, that your are and so I shared that as a pattern of questioning that I've um, learned from this committee. Um, and of course, you all know that we are a large school district and we do have a lot of turnover and leadership, so that is obviously a challenge, but we know this is very important. Um, um, and we know those structures are important across the board. And so what we um, had talked about and the team put in place is that that will be a part of the way that we um, roll this out that can then be a model for other initiatives. So we have that structure in place. Thank you very, very much. And I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mack and uh, Ms. Shea and Ms. Roller. Thank you so much, Barry Farrell. Uh, the timeline and Ms. Shea, your last comment on point uh, that you know that was coming. How will the parents know what kind of PD to make sure everyone is hearing the same thing uh, and what you're putting out there that you want our students and our parents to know. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call, uh, go to Mr. Offerman to see if he has any questions and then uh, Mr. Kuhn has a comment. Mr. Offerman? None at this time, thank you. All right, thank you. And I'm looking around, I, so I trust Mr. Mahomes has not joined us. Uh, Dr. Hager uh, noted in the chat, she thanked 
you for the clarification. So great, thank you. Um, Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you, Ms. Pasteur. And I just wanna thank everyone for this presentation. I think it's very valuable. Um, as you said, Ms. Pasteur, we're walking a fine line here. Um, what the school provides to our students and our children is important, but our parents have to be very engaged, especially on this topic. Uh, it's a sensitive topic. Um, I have, uh, being a parent of five children, uh, we've actually experienced um, uh, some curriculum hiccups uh, personally uh, that we're heading in, in a poor direction. So I'm glad to see that we have a group of folks very focused on getting you know, high quality curriculum out in front of, of our children. And we also have to realize that they are children. We sit here and talk about students all the time and student rights. We're talking about what, 10 year old children, 10, 11 year old children, um, and what they are going to be subjected to uh, by our school system. So parents need to be very, very focused on what's available and what their children, what the messages are that their children are gonna be receiving in school. So I, I, I make that comment because I believe that, and I hope that this, presentation is actually given to the entire board in open session so that the people that can that 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 come to those meetings you know this this material is all available because I think it's important when uh, sexual education is changing in our schools and being modified that everybody's aware of the messages so again thank you uh, and I look forward to learning more and I also am very hopeful that um, I, I see that Parents were brought in in the spring of 21 based on your presentation, which is basically a, a couple of months ago, but this has been underway, I think, since 2019. I don't know where else they've been involved, but I also want to make sure that they're involved the entire way because as professionals, um, educators, you know, are focused on delivering curriculum, but parents need to be there uh, because they know what, what they're comfortable with and what they want their children subjected to. Thank, Thank you. you. And actually, our parents are part of our Family Life and Human Sexuality Committee, so they, they've been a part of the entire process. That's that's fantastic. I, and, I and truly I appreciate want, that. And, and I also want to echo Mr. Kuhn. I think that your um, point about parents as partners is true for all of the content areas. And I also um, agree that when there are topics that may seem um, sensitive, as you described, uh, we don't like to think that we're subjecting students to anything because that phrase feels as if we're um, doing something. We like to think of it as providing opportunities for education, which we think helps keeps children safe um, and helps them make healthy choices. But we support your idea that parents are such an important part of this collaboration because I never want to catch a parent unaware. And that's something that I, I hold dear in my heart just as an administrator. That was a message we give about everything. I, you know, we used to talk about, and Ms. Pester will speak to you as an administrator on report card day, there should not be surprises because parents should be partners. So I think your point about parents being um, active participants and partners to push on us, um, our parents were really vocal and supportive and we're also really um, positive about the role parents can play in helping to support teachers and support their children. You know, I, um, like you, am a parent. I have a son in fifth grade right now. Uh, so we were uh, live action experiencing this while the team was putting this together. Um, we had a countdown. Uh, it's a big deal in fifth grade when these lessons are happening for the kids and for the teachers. So we appreciate this um, point that you're making about parents um, being active partners because they're coming home. And then I was in a position to say, well, what did you talk about today? Do you have any questions or anything I can help you with? So we um, appreciate that point. Um, and I would say expand it to all contents that parents um, and caregivers and everyone that students live with are really important partners in that. Yeah, I'll, I'll also share because, you know, as parents, we, we realize our children are all different and they communicate or don't communicate right. <laughs> what's happening uh, to Some parents. I nothing, ask every day right? what happened in what happened in school today? Oh, nothing. 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 Nothing, Nothing happened. Lunch, Nothing right? at all. And I do think that point that Mr. Kuhn just made is, is perfect, not just for this, but for all of the things that, um, that we do, because we assume, like it was said, that if you get nothing back, if the form doesn't come back, 
you're assuming we're moving on thinking that there is um, um, agreement with moving on with the student. And sometimes things are stuck in the bottom of backpacks, et cetera. But that's the beauty of, um, or they had just forgotten because it really isn't imp as important sometimes as playing with one of your friends and something that's happening on the phone. But your timeline is uh, is tight and it's good and and you've engaged the student and I think it changes the the paradigm um, when you are using that word collaboration then suddenly it becomes an opportunity and that's something that is thrusted on students not even because the state mandated but it becomes an opportunity for students and parents so I want to um, Thank you. So with that being said, Dr. McComas, I'm going to throw it back yes, to you. Yes, ma'am. But before we do that, Mr. Kuhn, I just want to let you know, while I don't um, manage the full board agenda at a minimum, what our team can do is we'll develop an executive summary of everything that was included in today's presentation, along with the link to the curriculum committee video archive and send to all of our board members in an update um, for you to I have as a resource when you're talking to community members. So at a minimum, we can do that as a resource and support for everybody. So thank you. And thank you for your participation um, in this to really that, important uh, topic for our Dr. Children. Thomas and Mr. Kuhn, what I will do as well um, is in uh, committee reports. When I do that, I will make a note that you're going to, to give that information so that folks on the board will know to look for it. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So um, um, on that, we will transition to our final topic for today's agenda, which is learning acceleration. We know, um, and, and by all means, if we need to, we will come back and um, do more with this in August if necessary, given the um, amount of time that we have today. We understand that everyone is um, excited about next school year and returning to in-person instruction, um, but everyone's also concerned, right? We know that the last 15 months have been uh, quite an uh, experience uh, that continued to evolve and change as health conditions evolved and change and vaccines emerged. Um, and so we know that everyone is concerned about how will we recover? How will we return to what the next normal is for us and our children um, and most importantly for our children because their life is moving forward uh, regardless of the pandemic and everything else in the world um, and we need to make sure that when they cross our finish line um, on that graduation stage that we have um, gone above and beyond to the greatest extent possible for each and every child. So on that, Mr. Jim, uh, Mr. Corns, Mr. Jim, you can tell my uh, South Baltimore uh, neighborhood is coming out. <laughs> Mr. Corns, if you could go on to our next presentation. Thank you. So we will, you will hear us talk a great deal about learning acceleration as really our primary frame of work uh, for bringing our children out of the pandemic and, and really merging together um, what they have been learning with what what they will be learning next year. And if you could go to the next slide. We really need to think about this as the next normal, right? There is a tendency to want to say, well, everything's just going to go backwards, but we can never go back in time. We can never undo the experiences we've had. We cannot undo the last 15 months for our children and ourselves. But what we can do is very thoughtfully um, and reimagine how do we merge what has been our lived experience and what are those things that we have learned, we have gained, and we are carrying forward and be very deliberate in identifying where there may be gaps that uh, were created as a function of interruption and, and changing conditions. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Okay. You can click through. This is an animated one. Thank you. And that's the last one uh, there, Jim. Thank you. Um, we know as we work with teachers, and this really applies even to um, our, our children, our young people, right? We know as humans that when we invest a great deal of energy and effort, we expect to see that payoff. We expect to see that impact uh, productively. And when we invest a great deal of energy and effort and we're not seeing that 
um, impact in the right direction, this is what leads to burnout over time. And so it's really important as we move forward that our teachers and our children and our parents understand that our energy and effort will um, yield an impact because it's really about understanding how not to fall into um, a, a cycle of um, remediation, if you will. And we're going to talk more about that as we move along. If you could go to the next slide. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Megan. We're going to tag team together. Yes, and you can click ahead, Mr. Corns, who I'm going to have to buy a present for having animations in the slide. I apologize. So as Dr. McComas said, and this board has talked a lot about in many of our meetings throughout this year um, because we are so empathetic to everything that our students, our families, and our educators have been through. When that agency that Dr. McComas um, described is not in place, we can start to see our efforts not yielding the impacts that we're used to seeing. And so it's really important, and part of this information um, is comes from a presentation we did with our school leaders, but then also information that will frame a lot of our summer work and then our back to school work with teachers. Because we know that the, the countdown is real for many of our educators. They are feeling that loss. They are feeling the number of challenges that they went through and that their agency has been impacted. And so we know that a part of our work in framing ourselves to be prepared to be our best teaching selves for our students when they come back in the fall, we have to reestablish that link between effort and impact. And as leaders, we can create opportunities by providing time for teachers for collaboration, by giving them meaningful um, feedback, and by recognizing the successes. It is really important that all of us who have some role in leadership, whether it's in your role as board members, our roles in CNI, and certainly in our school buildings, that we do recognize the incredible successes that we have realized. I think about it every time I see all these images of our students earning scholarships and winning awards and, and all the things that continued because our educators reimagined and our families reestablished that link. We also know that in order to do that, we have to center those social emotional learning core competencies. And those core competencies that we use in our school climate and safety team are about becoming aware of your own agency or your own feelings and how that might be impacting the decisions you make, strengthening those relationships. So much of the work that will need to happen in the fall um, to think about our conversation before, why going backwards or why retention? And it makes sense why people think that. If they're thinking that they've missed a year, the natural inclination is I'm gonna go back and do it again. We know as educators that the research doesn't support that, but we do understand and empathize with that instinct. And so it's important that we build those relationships with families so that they have trust in us that we're going to be able to accelerate their children, keep them in grade and course level, and we're going to talk about how that should inform our decision making. Next one, please. I put into the chat a link to an article that I'm going to excerpt um, in a couple of slides, but before that I wanted to share this um, quote here on the left. The words you speak become the house you live in. Um, this is typically quoted, um, attributed to a Persian poet, um, but it speaks volumes about how our language matters. And so in the national frame of this year, there has been a lot of discussion and the words learning loss are often used. And while we understand and appreciate what's trying to be noted about this tremendous impact, what can happen over time is those words can become the house we live in. And so if we're focused on the deficit and focusing on what we've lost, that can be an impetus to lower our expectations. And so if you put that into the classroom, if we have third grade teachers or seventh grade teachers think that their job is to go back, if they're focused on that loss, that will serve to further marginalize students who have suffered the most in this pandemic because they will fall further behind and those gaps will widen. So while we're not suggesting that we don't acknowledge the tremendous impact that this pandemic has had and certainly all the losses that our students and our teachers have experienced, rather than centering that loss, what we want to think about is what are the learning leaps? What will students need to do in order to be ready for grade level and course level content? And so rather than centering the loss, we think about what is it that they need to be successful in this course and in this grade level. Next slide, please. Again, Dr. McComas described, and I won't read this to you, but I did want you to see the article that it's excerpted from, but what they're talking about is that if as a district, we focus on this. We're going to further center that trauma and students are going to begin to internalize the story of that loss and feel that they are themselves 
deficit or in somehow responsible for that gap. Rather, instead, we have to think about what is our role as educators in understanding what is the most important learning and how do I scaffold that student so that he, she, or they can be successful in this greater course level content. Next slide. We will have an opportunity to use lots of different measures. We know that we're going to have an expectation at the state to give the um, fall assessment to help us to diagnose. We in CNI are developing rich tasks to help educators diagnose those unfinished learning opportunities. But rather than using them as labels for sorting students or for sending them backwards, we're going to use that data as a flashlight instead of a hammer. We're going to use it to help us as teachers and co collaborate with our students so that they understand what do you need to do right now. I'm going to teach you third grade math, but I'm going to first identify what I need to scaffold from second grade math so that you can be successful. Next slide. And so our curriculum teams are focusing on providing those resources and all of our summer professional learning that we're doing with administrators as early as June and with teachers well into July and certainly in August. And we've already started. We started this conversation in April and May to help our teachers to be reframing it. We know and I'll give a couple of different examples. Um, one most recently, obviously nothing like the global pandemic, um, but there were studies done with students in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Many of those parishes in New Orleans closed school for a really long time and students did not have school. Some schools responded by retaining large groups of students. Some schools responded with an acceleration mindset and researchers studied the impact and found that it is much more beneficial for students to have those opportunities to be promoted, to have those scaffolds of support, but always within the context of grade level learning. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it back to Dr. McComas just to do a more nuanced discussion of the difference. Right. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, and I'm going to, over the next couple slides, really get into what is the distinction between a sort of traditional remediation <clears throat> remediation mindset and approach compared to an accelerated mindset and accelerate learning approach. And what are the sort of um, framework for accelerated um, accelerate approach. And so when we think about remediation, we often think about that traditional drill and kill approach, right? We're going to do this again and again and again until we get it right. And while there, um, that has been a traditional approach, what we see is it, it really isolates the skill. It really doesn't draw on student relevancy. And in fact, we end up spinning uh, our time um, and, and what that does is we end up falling further and further and further behind. And we see that this has been sort of the traditional pattern over a long period of time in schooling when we take that approach um, as our primary uh, way of trying to um, fill in interrupted or missing skills and content knowledge. Rather than the accelerate learning approach, as Ms. Shea was just speaking to, that really comes out of evidence and research. We know that when we really focus on keeping students moving forward and that in real time you're identifying okay here is the specific content and knowledge that that mary lacks right now rather than me not moving forward and we just stop and drill and kill we're going to fold that in we're going to fold it in in a relevant real-time way so that we're keeping her moving um, as opposed to stalling her out and spinning the wheel so if we could go to the next slide and I'm, I'm trying to pick up my speed a little bit in light of the time. Um, um, and Dr. Yeah. McComas, I just want to note in the chat, um, Dr. Hager has suggested perhaps we, we're definitely going to wind up coming back and talking yeah. more about this in July. And maybe we want to have opportunity if you want to go to the next thing. And I defer to you. I just want to make sure you saw it in the um, chat. Yes, I um, I agree. I definitely uh, think. Let me just point out, I'm a teacher. I saw it, I already had it in my brain that I was getting ready to stop you, but this is not a good time to stop you. So okay. I, get through <laughs> I trust you. Okay, I got Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and, and I agree because this is important and I t I completely think we'll, we will be back in August with um, more as well. Um, Mr. Corns, if you could go to the next slide. What you have on a slide here really talks about sort of the difference between the traditional remediation and our accelerated approach here. We see that the traditional remediation, some of the the, the things that we associate with that, right, is the slow group or the, the group um, that's that's um, lacking in progress. And, there, and what happens is that we really do end up 
creating a deeper hole for our students in this way, or they fall farther and farther behind from reaching the finish line. Uh, typically, these um, skills are taught in isolation, as I was talking about, and we see some of the less engaging um, approaches to pedagogy, you know, uh, worksheets. Again, it goes along with this idea of drilling, drilling students until they uh, are, have perfected uh, that particular skill or content uh, knowledge, um, inadvertently creating a deficit um, for them because if they're not continuing to move forward, they end up falling further and further behind. Acceleration, the key thing here is we're really using um, efficacy, you know, that we talked about in the beginning, this idea that effort and energy equals a, an impact, right? And we're building upon that, we're leveraging that as an asset in this in this process, and that we are tying it to critical real-time uh, relevant experiences that are rigorous and on grade level. Um, it is quick, it is moving forward, it is not this idea that we're just going to spin until everything is absolutely perfect. We're going to learn in real time as we go, just as we do in the real world, right? As professionals, we often uh, find ourselves in innovative or new novel situations, and we have to learn as we go, folding in um, to our knowledge base and our skill set. If you could move on to the next slide. Here is a, a quote again. Um, pulled from research around learning acceleration. And what has really proven itself out to be critical here is that students have consistently, um, consistent access and receive grade level materials, tasks, and assignments along with appropriate scaffolds that make the work accessible. And so those scaffolds are really where we infuse or fold in perhaps the missing knowledge or the missing skill. And in, and this has proven out to be more successful instead of sending students backwards to fill in those gaps, just as we've been discussing. If you could go on to the next slide. Thank you. The goals for learning acceleration you see here uh, that, that pull itself out, but what I most want to draw your attention to, and you'll hear me reiterate this uh, today, and I think most likely throughout all of next year. Um, number five, students have access to strong instruction that addresses gaps in prior learning um, that they have in the context of grade appropriate assignments focused on priority content. Again, it is important that we are leveraging uh, what is the right grade level for them and folding in in real time those just in time deliverables around uh, closing content knowledge or skill um, practice that needs to be put in place. The other thing that's really important here is um, that our students and families are treated as partners in this process and that students feel like they, they belong. What happens we know socially, emotionally, when students are sectioned off and put in those um, traditional remediation sections, right? They start to internalize exactly what Ms. Shea talked about. They start to internalize that I'm the problem um, and they start to uh, build this identity of my effort doesn't yield any outcome. And that's part of what contributes to them falling further and further behind as opposed to keeping them in the game, if you will, keeping them in real time, folding in that um, the, the um, prior knowledge that they need extra help on or they need extra practice on as they're continuing to move forward. That empowers students and motivates them to incorporate the two and to keep on track. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, Ms. Dr. McComas, this yes. is where I want us to stop. Right okay. here, just on that piece, just right now. Sure. Um, okay, uh, and the first thing I want to say to this first part is your con the comment um, effort uh, and impact because we spend too much time on busy work and a whole lot of things and think that because everybody seems to be doing a lot um, that's gonna have the positive impact. I think everybody on this committee, you wanna take something away, process those words, relationship, between effort and impact. And it's what we're putting in that is going to make a difference and how we put it in. Not that we're just shoving a whole lot of stuff at children thinking this is what they need. This is what will be good for them. It must be meaningful. That being said, I'm gonna turn 
to the other teacher here, uh, Mr. Offerman, and then Ms. Mack. Um, the other, Ms. Mr. Offerman, first. Yes, first I want to I want to thank you for the presentation, at least as uh, as uh, as far as you've gotten. Uh, and I I really think that this direction of 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 accelerating learning is a uh, is far superior to concentrating on going over stuff that students either didn't get or didn't 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 uh, didn't fully master. Uh, as a math teacher, though, I, I have to I have to just bring up the, the concept that and perhaps this is being covered and, and I think it adds a certain degree. Uh, there are some skills or there, there are some knowledge that if you don't have it. And again, this is my this is my math that you teach, but you're not going to be successful at the uh, at the next level or or uh, in the next phase. And I just want to, you know, I want to comment. It's not really a question. Make sure that that, the, that we're able to identify what things are absolutely essential that uh, the students have before we ask them to to, to go on and to uh, handle uh, new uh, new uh, work. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. That's a great um, that's a great question and a great point. Uh, we haven't gotten to the next slide, but the next slide really talks about prioritizing the critical grade level. Uh, standards, right? So that gets at the heart of what you're talking about is understanding really what those prerequisite skills and knowledge are to in order to be successful on that rigorous grade level standard um, and the um, the importance as well of diagnosing that right to identify that Mary needs to master her math facts before she can go into algebraic equations, right? And that's Amen. why the diagnosis <laughs> Did I say, see, I got you, Mr. Hoffman. So, well, you know, yeah. so this is why it's really important for us to have strong diagnostic resources um, for our teachers in every unit so that they can see very clearly here's my group of students. I need to really do small group intensive instruction to close that skill gap, to, to clarify their understanding, to dispel any. Um, misconceptions they have and to have them work on that practice. But you do that really in that small group targeted instruction. And then when you bring the whole group together, you're working on it. So students can, this is where the relevancy comes in. When students are trying to solve real world problems that are intriguing problems, right? And you know as a mathematician that there are a lot of, if we make math relevant, meaning in real world uh, context, students understand and they're motivated. So this is where we help them understand you have have to know your math facts so that we can get on and solve this other piece, which is much more interesting and intriguing than just perhaps a fluency math uh, issue. Um, and Miss Shea, if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Just to quickly say that my teams are working really hard to provide all those resources for teachers to help them with that. So we're helping them prioritize content, helping them with rich diagnostic tasks and helping them with um, also leveraging what we've learned this year. So there's been some bright spots. So how can we leverage what we've learned about asynchronous learning to help fill in some of that work and be more of a proactive pre-teaching space rather than always um, reacting? And then the last thing I would add is that the question we've asked of administrators and teachers is how do you know? How do you know that they don't yet have that skill and need it? Because too often we assume or we make a sweeping plan out of love and concern and empathy, but it can actually have the effect of lowering the bar and lowering expectations. And that's what we're trying to um, ward off with this type of presentation. Yes, uh, I want to jump in here. I know Ms. Mack has a question and I'm guessing Dr. Hager, um, but this is why I thought this would be a good spot to mm -hmm. stop because you've put the magic buzzwords in our heads. So as we leave this committee meeting and move out into the world, we can help our parents and others see in this direction. Let's start processing the positive that we put in, doing what Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Mr. Offerman said that and, and what Dr. McComas said, we are going to talk prior, prioritizing things, but this is what I want to ask you to do because time is running out. I want us, Dr. McComas, to talk about 
how we shape the August meeting because this is critical mass information and it should not be compacted so that we will be prepared in August to really dive into this so that we can be helpful to our constituents in their thinking. Ms. Mack. Thank you, Ms. Bestier. Um, I know this is an operations question, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. There was a lot of discussion about the 122.3 positions that were not included in the budget, and then um, the county executive has encouraged BCPS to utilize those positions. And I understand that we don't know what our headcounts I think you froze. You did freeze, Ms. Mack. Well, while you're trying to unfreeze, oh, maybe okay. double up on teachers in classrooms. We think we're gonna. Oh, she froze again. All right, Dr. Hager, do you double up teachers in classrooms where we think we're skills a need? That's my my first and my second question is. I understand the SEL benefits of heterogeneously blended classes for children who are struggling. Those slides very clearly pointed that out. But what are we going to do to ensure that our kids who are in those classes who did not experience a great learning loss, that their needs are met also? Okay, and before you answer, Ms. Mack, because Ms. Mack, we missed all of your first question. You were frozen. So I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Hager to come in and see if we can have a blended answer, Dr. McComas. And while that is happening, I'm going to call Ms. Scott and ask for five minute grace here. Okay. <laughs> Scott, so, is Dr. Actually, Hager, um, can you give the short yeah. version and hopefully Dr. McComas can respond. So let me let me say one thing, Ms. Mack, I genuinely only got bits and pieces of your first question. So I'm just going to ask if you send us uh, that let question. Me, yeah, let me just. Uh, all I want to know is, do we have any creativity, any um, ability to utilize the 122.3 positions to utilize teachers in maybe two teachers in a classroom where we know that we really have our work cut out for us? I'm not asking for an answer right now. I'm throwing that out. Okay. And then my second is, how are we going to ensure that kids who didn't have a significant learning loss, who are in a heterogeneously blended class, that they're not stagnating, that their needs are met too? Sure. So one of the key things is this: the students that you're saying that we're referring to that have not, you know, they did well, right, over the course of this journey. Um, first and foremost, as always, they will be having, um, they will be learning gr rigorous grade level standards. So they will be working on the work that is appropriate for their grade level. The, the, the methodology of acceleration can be used to accelerate students, right? So if you are, you know, I'll, I'll use our um, head and shoulders as an example, right? Anytime you're trying to move a student ahead on skills concepts, um, perhaps faster than they typically would, because they have the readiness to do so, you're still going to be using the pedagogy of uh, targeted small group instruction, differentiated materials, perhaps even different differentiated um, methodology. Uh, and again, I always, you know, my um, team member, Miss Shea, if there's anything you'd like to elaborate on that, I know our Just, time is. Um Yep, real quick, my team in academics had the same thought, Ms. Mack, because of course kids had very different experiences. And so when they're designing these diagnostic tasks, this overlay, so they're not writing a whole new third curriculum for the 21-22 school year, but when they're creating these diagnostic tasks, what they're providing for teachers is if students have not yet met the standard, here's a support or scaffold. If students have met this prerequisite standard, here's how you can enrich. So they're actually centering this idea of not every child had the same experience this year. And so some kids are absolutely ready for that rigorous, but all kids need the instruction at grade level. It's just a matter of where they are on that pathway. And so the team is um, taking that same approach in providing those resources for teachers about how to use that diagnostic information to plan for students in the way you described. Thank you. You're welcome. We will be back in August. We look forward to um, finishing and having more robust conversation about this. And I think we'll be even more excited because we'll be so close to the next school year. I at think that Dr. Hager did the past for five, I, excuse me, since I asked for five uh, from um, oh. Scott, 
Doctor, at least I want to hear, and I already called on Dr. Hager before yes, Ms. Mack reiterated her questions. Um, Dr. Hager, I at least want us to hear what you had to say, please. Uh, well, it was actually very similar to uh, to Ms. Mack's um, question. See, I knew mean, that, didn't I say? Let Dr. Hager, <laughs> you could give one answer. Yeah. I, I, know, know. I was like, okay, let me just squeeze it. Um, no one ever listens to me. Go ahead. <laughs> So my question was about the other end of the spectrum. We know there are kids who were not engaged at all. I mean, and not not I'm not talking about a, a gap. I'm talking about really not engaged. Right. Right. Are we are we holding any children back at all? Or are those children who really didn't engage and not attend all year? Are they going to be part of the scaffolding process, or are we um, are we are we going to try to hold them back in some way? Our retention policy as as it's normal, we have not modified our retention policy. And so if we have parents who, you know, and, and students in that case that really need to be addressed at the school level with the the school using our normal process, we do, we do every year have those those cases where maybe that is the appropriate decision. I think um, one of the things I just caution uh, us as a, as a society for is that we're not broad sweeping holding uh, children back because a, a decision of such gravity and that's a very serious decision and and um, and I mean that with complete respect right um, it's a very serious decision academically socially emotionally developmentally um, that needs to be handled individually and with with full attention from that sort of comprehensive team partnership of parents schools you know um, um, related services, right? So I would just say uh, that, uh, Dr. Hager, if you have families who are concerning that, please ask them to engage with their with their school because we have not altered our process around retention. Um, we recognize that that is, is a, a pathway, a process, um, and that, you know, there may be occasions in which that's appropriate. I just always caution uh, that that's not a decision to ma be made in haste um, and to and I would also say, um, and again, those more extreme cases, there's probably a lot more service and support besides just academics that our children and family perhaps need support on. Um, but in general, you know, I, I just ask everyone to recognize the entire world's pace changed, right? So I know people are afraid about their children being behind, um, but the whole world was behind, right? The whole world interrupt was interrupted. So, um, so I'll just leave it at that. And as always, we're happy to answer questions. We look right. forward to our next opportunity with you, right. everyone. All right, our five minutes are now up by my clock. Uh, I want to thank everyone again, Dr. McComas. You and I will talk so that we can lay this out. This needs to have more time. Uh, than was given. So everyone look forward to the rest of this, uh, probably consuming as much as possible our August meeting. So the other two, I now um, am going to call this meeting uh, to an end and I'm going to demand that everyone on this call have a wonderful, wonderful July and come back refreshed. Dr. McComas, I need you to call me, please. Yeah. Okay, we'll do. Thank, thank you. Have a Have good a great summer. Talk to you. Thank all. you all so much. Thank we you. appreciate you. Thank you.